Hello, you're watching news from Kazakhstan. It is Thursday, October 4th. I am Norbek Savitakhunov. Uh, former parliamentarian Amadjan Raskali is wanted, announced the Financial Police Press Service on Wednesday, October 3rd. A criminal case was opened against the former public servant, and actual parties suspended the suspect's membership. Details next. Wanted by the party members and the police, Amanjan Raskalif, involved in the corruption scandal as well as his brother Bergi, has disappeared. The leader of Akjol, Azad Pirwashev, who was recently defending a member of his parliamentary group, is now relying on the facts. He says that he tried to get through to Raskalif over the phone and invite him to a session right after the court sanctioned his arrest, but to no avail. Let's start with the legal procedures. We still consider the presumption of innocence. However, if the court will find Raskaliev guilty, then we will be inclined to expel him from the party. The politic Turganbek Uli is also a member of Akjol. He's been its member even before Azad Pirwashev joined the party. During the latest parliamentary elections, Turganbek Uli, along with other older party members, warned a new leader that the businessmen he involved could be corrupt, but nobody listened to them back then. I'm convinced this is only the beginning. This entire scandal is because they put him in the spotlight. But if you check on the other party members who obtained the membership through money because they're very rich, it might cause a much worse public reaction. I'm very confident of that. The MP shall be subjected to the total purge, says the ex-senator Zauresh Batalova. High-profile reshuffles and series of corruption cases against officials attests to the fact that high authorities are experiencing a crisis. The Raskaliev brothers, who believe to be associates of the former head of the president's administration, Aslan Musin, have been engaging the policy of all permissiveness for a long time, says Batalova. They repeatedly stated in public that they are part of the presidential team. Lately, the society didn't have much trust in the government and parliament. There are many people similar to Amanjan Raskalif in the parliament. I speak on behalf of a large number of Kazakhstan citizens and the members of the international community. The question is, what kind of parliament is it, where its members obtain mandates and later leave and are brought to justice? Azad Pirwashev indirectly confirmed the fact that the reputation of Akjol was seriously blurred. Dodging the questions of the reporters in the lobby on Wednesday, he made it clear that the scandal with Amanjan Raskaliev didn't play out in favor of the faction. Meanwhile, his party fellow Sirik Turgunbek Uli says the former MP Raskaliev, also known as Ak Aman in the Atarao region, is capable of giving an adequate response to the former boss by revealing how he managed to obtain the mandate and the price he paid for it. Up to half of Kazakhstan citizens are unprepared to inform on corrupt officials even for money. Such were the results of a survey published online on Wednesday. The rules of financial rewards for informants were approved by the government a month ago. But as it turns out, the population doubts that this kind of fight against bribery is ethical. Piles of money for reporting on a bribe taker do not appeal to people. Web portal Nur.kz asked its readers as whether they are ready to report in cases of corruption for money. As a result, 37% of respondents do not believe that the case of corruption will be proved and bribe taker will serve a jail time. In addition, citizens are afraid that they will be charged for slander. 11% of them simply don't want to be a stool pigeon. 24% will do anything for money and remaining 22% are ready to report on corrupted officials for free. The question of the day drew attention of thousands of people. The editorial office of online news service is sure that results of the poll would be surely projected on whole population of the state. 3,000 people participated in the poll and way more than in similar polls conducted by social research institutes. It seems to me that internet polls are quite reliable and could be trusted. Pavlodar journalist Olga Varanko used to often write about cases of corruption. However, she personally would not report on corrupted official. According to her, in Kazakhstan, the reward system of informers is not likely to benefit anyone. Powerful people will always find a way out, and it is not the one who took the bribe will be punished, but the one who reported. I personally, of course, wouldn't go to financial police because I don't trust to this mechanism of punishment in our state. I would do it if I was in the United States, but here, if I had any kind of hard evidence such as audio or video recordings, I would just write an article on this case and I wouldn't ask for any reward except for a bonus from the editorial office.
вознаграждения, ну кроме гонорара от редакции. About a month ago, Financial Police announced on the chance to earn money for reporting on corrupted officials. Moreover, its spokesman even showed the price list during the press briefing. The law-abiding citizen could earn over 1,000 for reporting. However, there are several nuances. The case of corruption should be proved and judgment of conviction should come into effect. There are also conditions for the informer. There's only one condition. To receive the reward, the statement should be signed by an actual person and not by an anonymous. The head of the social research center, Жанар Жандосова, believes that the reward system of informers will not work in real life of Kazakhstan. She proposes a different solution, that is to make the information on income of officials open to public access. Otherwise, it creates mutual distrust among people similar to the days of Stalin, when everyone kept an eye on each other. Actually, this decree is provoking a social discord for which some people can even get a jail time. Of course, it is not normal. They are doing it instead of taking steps for a greater transparency of public servants' income, whose salaries we pay through our taxes. Meanwhile, the financial police already started receiving written and verbal statements about the cases of corruption. The number of citizens that filed their statements is not known yet, but judging by the number of instigated criminal cases in the last month, the residents of Atarao region could have been the most active ones. In Uralsk, the District Court Appeals Board upheld the lower court's decision in the case of former head of domestic policy Tleka Bulimashev against the newspaper Uralska Nedelia and journalist Lukpanak Medyarov. To recount three months ago, the official was offended by the publication incriminating him of family ties with Astana Mayor Imogalitas Magambetov and filed a suit against it. The court estimated the plaintiff's moral damages at 33,000 US dollars. The newspaper itself deems the verdict illegal and believes the amount is too excessive. They still intend to appeal the decision, even if they have to appeal to international organizations. Of course we are going to appeal. It is a matter of principle for us to use all the opportunities that are offered by the national law. We must go through all the formal procedures in Kazakhstan. And in the worst case scenario, if all the courts will leave the decision unchanged, only in that case we will appeal to the international organizations in order to defend our rights. Meanwhile, 73 cents for a liter of regular. Starting Wednesday, there are new price tags hanging at gas stations in Kazakhstan. The National Agency for Regulation of Natural Monopolies approved the oil and gas ministry's request to increase the marginal cost of fuel in connection with the rise of oil prices. Our correspondents attempted to find out why is there expensive fuel in an oil-rich country. Yesterday was a day of change in Almaty. By lunchtime, petrol stations hastily replaced price tags. The price for the most popular petrol, 92 octane, has gone up from 70 to 73 cents per liter. Diesel oil has gone up by 2 cents and petrol, 80 octane, by 1 cent. Petrol stations said it was caused by increased prices for oil. Petrol stations said that when the price of oil decreased by 20 percent, the wholesale market increased the price for diesel by 32 percent. A rise in oil prices by 4 percent led to higher prices for petrol by as much as 25 percent. Thus, as confirmed by state authorities, the increase in raw materials prices in no way affect increased petrol prices. However, fluctuations in oil prices depend on the fact that Kazakhstan buys its own raw materials. The government actually owns only 20% of the oil, the other 80% belongs to foreign companies. Therefore, the country has to obey foreign companies' rules. The first step to have our own oil is to increase the share of the government as well as public companies in developed fields. Kazakhstan itself produces 2.5 million tons of petrol per year, and it is not quite the best quality. Petrol is provided by three oil refineries. The experts explain that the production cost of fuel is much higher because refineries do not work at full power, only 65%. Shumkent and Palvadar refineries were constructed at least 20 years ago. They were processing Western Siberian oil. However, Russia has cut off its supplies since 1991. Palvadar refinery had to process high paraffin crude oil from Mangishlak. As a result, we provided domestic market with poor quality product. Another issue is resellers. There are too many of them between the manufacturer and the seller, the gas stations. The Fuel Association has repeatedly appealed to the government to restrain wholesalers. The current price is less than 17 percent. We keep saying that it is a loss and ask to set the price within 25 and 30 percent, like in Russia. It is necessary to balance wholesale and retail prices. Consumers turn out to be the most vulnerable in this chain. Drivers who have not had the chance to stock up on petrol are wondering why prices for petrol keep going up in the country, which owns large reserves of oil. 
нефтяной стране живем. Living in an oil-rich country, we expect decreased prices. It is quite possible if more refineries are built. The government seems to keep petrol prices down, but now things are left to take their own course, and I think 73 cents per liter is just the beginning. The prices must be kept down. First of all, oil must supply the domestic market, and then go to export and other purposes. New refineries must be built since there are only three in our country. People are concerned that the rise in petrol prices will result in price rises for transportation, freight, food and utilities. The salaries, however, remain unchanged. Now only the farmers are more or less protected, because the government regulates the prices for diesel oil during the farming season. The monopoly agency commented on the price hikes, noting that the increase was quite expected in connection with alleged earlier significant reductions in the price of gasoline. Interesting, the public, lead, the public does not seem to recall a sharp decline. Internet users skeptically suggest that in the coming autumn and winter, prices at the pump may go up yet again. If you remember, the prices for petrol dropped in July. This also had to do with the weighted average price drop for Brent oil. It amounted to $104 in June. However, the price for Brent rose, and it resulted in a price rise for petrol accordingly. In other news, members of parliament spoke out against Russian dictatorship within the customs union, asking government officials to eliminate the imbalance of Kazakhstan's negotiators within the alliance apparatus, the body that is responsible for final decisions. Otherwise, they claim that interests of the republic will be seriously harmed. The trend of discrimination can be traced even now, claim deputies of the lower chamber. The next report from the plenary session has more. The policy of Russian rule is obvious. The parliament today confirmed citing official figures what Kazakhstanis feared the most at the time of joining the customs union. According to these figures, the neighboring state is dominating at the central governing body of the union, which parliamentarians feel influences the decision-making process. The interests of Kazakhstan may just not be taken into account, although the membership fees of all the countries are equal. Our negotiators visit for a day or two, but all the important things are happening there, and we have to pay attention to this and realize that the staff of the union's headquarters is paid from the membership fees, which Kazakhstan pays as well. The fact that the parliament speaker spoke of such an important political issue shows the discrimination of the interests of Kazakhstan. Usually, Kam Nigmatulin used fairly stern words when demanding the government to eliminate such an obvious misbalance. His information shows that Kazakhstan and Belarus have only 5% of seats and the union's governing body. Other negotiators are from Russia. Speaker's eye-opening speech paved the way for the other members of the parliament's criticism. Recently, a Tamekin party's representative spoke of his participation in this negotiation process and said that our negotiators looked like schoolboys because the consultants that work for the union are of a very high level. They used to work for McKinsey. How well are our people prepared to represent Kazakhstan's interests there? One of such negotiators is the Minister of Finance to whom all the criticism was addressed. He tried to justify himself and said that it is the quality of the negotiation process that is important and not the number of country representatives. He said that he doesn't feel any diktat and his colleagues are representing countries' interests favorably. I can assure you that there are no whipping boys at the customs union. Of course, it is clear that the issue of the increasing the quality of negotiators' team is important, but I wouldn't say that all the teams there are stronger. But the actions of the strong in Zhamishev's opinion Kazakh negotiators are an evidence of the weak process which was pointed out at the previous session of the parliament when the discrimination of the domestic car makers was discussed. According to their information, Russia decreased the customs duty rates twofold, which Kazakhstan can do since it's not a WTO member. Anyhow, today parliamentarians once again showed how their words mismatched their deeds. After speaking of the open dictate from the main member of the customs alliance, they adopted the treaty on further integration within the framework of the union. Head of the National Human Rights Center, Vyacheslav Kaluzny, believes that citizens' freedoms of assembly and the right to demonstrate are not violated in Kazakhstan. Whether Vladimir Kozlov was affected by such violations as Western activists claim, Kaluzny declined to comment, explaining that it is for the court to decide. As for strong restrictions on party registration, the chief human rights expert agreed that the problem exists and his agency's stance is clear. A party must be registered. That being said, he did note that Alha Party's unregistered status is due to errors in submitted documents.
Alga party has to carefully review its list of members which it is submitting for registration, because as they say, there are many dead souls up until now. Therefore, it could either mean that Alga does not want to get registered by simply showing unverified list of members, or it will not be registered. Vyacheslav Kalyuzhin also talked about participation of Kazakhstan's delegation in the annual OSCE meeting in Warsaw. He stated that the National Action Plan for Human Rights developed by the government received the full approval of Western institutions. Former MP Zaurish Batalova, who attended the same conference and made a report in Warsaw, argues that Kazakhstan received quite serious criticism. As a matter of fact, the national plan was not carried out. In essence, when civil society came to believe in this national plan, it started collaborating with the government on the implementation of this plan, and now it feels disappointed and believes the plan should be reviewed. In other news, on Tuesday evening, a charity show in support of convicted Janaozian oil workers and dissident Aron Atabek was held in London. Renowned cellist Alfiana Kibekova was on stage, and the show will be featured in the upcoming documentary on riots in Janaozian. It is being filmed by a British director and will be released on the one-year anniversary of the December events in the oil town. The concert of the famous violin cellist with Kazakh origins Alfiana Kibekova in one of the music halls of London is not something uncommon. She's been a British citizen for 30 years, yet she remains Kazakh inside. She was giving this two-hour concert in support of political prisoners in Kazakhstan who were convicted following the December events in Janozien. <laughs> When I saw the footage of shooting in Janozien, I realized, just like any other person with a conscience, I can't remain indifferent, despite the fact that I've been living abroad for already 30 years. I want to show moral support to the people who are undergoing such suffering, and of course to raise money. I also want to draw public attention to this issue because, when I tell my friends about it, many of them can't believe this is really happening in the country that claims to be democratic. The concert took place with English modesty and without long and eloquent speeches in a small room with a small logo in the center of the stage. European activists from Campaign Kazakhstan were among the organizers of the charity concert. They understand why Europe doesn't raise the issue of tragic events in Janozien and they don't approve of it. That's exactly the reason why the Campaign Kazakhstan along with cellists from Kazakhstan have organized this concert in one of the music halls of London. We've plenty of connections with Kazakhstan, including Tony Blair, various businesses and metals of value. Why do the government and politicians keep quiet? To make it all the more clear, during performance of Alfiana Kibekova and her team, the footage of shooting in Janozien was shown to the audience, along with the photos of another political prisoner of Kazakhstan, Aron Atabek. His life story has shocked the Europeans. Exactly five years ago, Atabek, the Kazakh poet, was sentenced to 18 years in prison for organizing mass riots in Shanarak Mikro district and the murder of a policeman in the summer of 2006. Back then, the authorities ordered to demolish Almaty's spontaneously emerged district that settled migrants from villages. That was the beginning of one of the most tragic confrontations in the history of Kazakhstan. Demanding to stop the assault, the rebels took hostage and poured gasoline over a 24-year-old Asyad Beysenov. Ignoring the hostage, the police continued the attack and someone lost his nerve and threw a match at Beysenov, who then burned to death. There were no direct evidence presented against Aron Atabek and six other members of Shanarak riot at the trial, which only made it all the more obvious that Kazakh poet was sentenced for his views. Aron's wife, who was invited to a concert in London, read his latest poems, which seem to be getting even more harsh lately. <laughs> These harsh words are the poems of Atabek that are read by his wife. She and her son arrive to share about what is happening to her husband these days. He will be turning 60, he received two wounds, but didn't receive any medical assistance upon the inflicted injuries. We will continue striving to meet with him because we haven't had a visit with him for several years already. The complaint that he addressed to Prosecutor General's office and the Penitentiary System Committee has been simply ignored. However, the mass media is aware of it, and that means that people are aware of it as well. In the meantime, we will continue seeking for his acquittal. Aron Atabek and other prisoners of Karajal colony addressed a letter to the Prosecutor General's office describing the prison conditions and detailed instances of torture. The officials as well as the society remain silent. Alfiana Kibekova calls to stand up for the poet and citizen of Kazakhstan to the end.
Alfia herself was planning to travel to Kazakhstan with MEP Paul Murphy back in spring to personally help the families of convicts. However, the MEP was denied a visa. So this time Alfia is planning to travel by herself, hoping that her views won't be an issue during the visa process. Power is finally restored in Kostangildi microdistrict in Jaskazgan, and utilities are working properly, says Karaganda Regional Administration. Victims of the hundred houses that were left without power are counting up material damage. Our correspondents follow the city's return to normal life. We have cleaned up here. There was a mess. The water is pumped out. Residents of Kostangildi area that was flooded last weekend are returning home. Look, it was up to my knees. All our furniture was floating, all home appliances. Half of the fridge was under the water. Entrepreneurs Tatiana and Sergei Kamich suffered too. Although the floors of their store are dry, the place itself is in a bad shape. The wet products had to be thrown away. Authorities haven't yet said who will reimburse the material damage. Our shop is completely flooded. We couldn't even shut the door and the water was all over. The special commission has been created in the region yesterday. Communal services officials and rescuers have to determine the amount of damages and name the reason of the floods within 10 days. They also have to say what will be the volume of the material assistance to the victims. We are currently identifying the sources of financing and everything will depend on the amounts of damage. Perhaps the regional governments can find the money in their funds. Department of Emergencies also announced that the expertise is scheduled to take place on the death of two people during the floods, 36-year-old female and a 5-year-old child. The preliminary version of the death is the current rush. In other news, MPs are accusing the Health Ministry of lobbying an unsafe experiment. The issue on the agenda is the vaccination of teenage girls against cervical cancer. MPs from Akjol faction label the campaign as an experiment over Kazakh children and compare it to a simple marketing ploy. According to the initiator of the request, the MP Miroert Kazbekova presumptive vaccination poses a real threat to the gene pool of Kazakh nation. She states that the treatment with the Gardasil vaccine has caused controversial public reaction in the United States, which led to the initiation of the independent anti-corruption investigation. She believes that marketing of the vaccine is nothing but an ordinary trade based on pathophobia, which could have caused a mandatory vaccination. In her speech addressed to the Minister of Health, the MP claims that the vaccinations should be strictly voluntary due to the lack of precise information on the exposure to the bodies of teenage girls. How come nobody mentions the risk for children? Why doesn't the vaccination program provide the calculations of the possible negative effects for the health of girls? Why the entire program focuses solely on the financial needs of departments, while the potential threats are simply ignored? We are inclined to believe that the lack of analysis of the expected risks only proves that we are dealing with a basic marketing mix or even worse, a secret experiment on the children of Kazakhstan. In cultural news, the selection process for the second international film festival of student films and cinema schools named Bastal was launched in Almaty. Young filmmakers from 20 countries are arriving to the city for this purpose. The event will be held from October 23rd to October 27th. According to the organizers, this is the only event in Kazakhstan that needs minimum investment. Guests are generally interested to share experience and find new acquaintances with foreign colleagues. We do not have to go through this red tape of concurrence with ministries and even on a governmental level. The heads of filmmaking universities come to agreement very easily because they know each other well. The associations have an advantage of making decisions very fast and effectively, and we are like one family. This year, the festival will be attended by young, talented people from the United States, Europe and Oriental states. The competition program will include shorts, live-action movies, cartoons and documentaries. The topic of including fully featured films is under discussion. The budget of the Bastao Festival will be much more modest than that of Eurasia International Film Festival recently held in Almaty. In the case of the latter, the organizers spent more on the stars of world cinema. However, prizes will also be awarded during the student festival. The winner of the Grand Prix will receive $1,000. 500 each will be awarded to those who win other nominations. According to the rector of Zhurgenevk, Arstanbek Muhammad Ali, the Bastao Film Festival is a good start for young filmmakers.
The main difference of our film festival from others is that it gives young talented filmmakers an opportunity to prove themselves. After all, our students do not participate in any competitions, and the taste of victory would give them an incentive to keep creating. We are hosting representatives of Berlin, France, and Turkey film academies, and each academy has its own direction. We have so much room to share experience. Finally, theater season has opened in Almaty. The first to open its doors was the Kabit Musrepa Theater, which is in its 67th season. According to tradition, one of the first shows to be staged is the famous poem legend Kozik Orpieshen by Jan Sulu. Once it was popular among the Kazakh intelligentsia, says the honored actress Rosa Sharbekova. In recent years, however, the elite does not indulge artists with their attention, but the actress says that the audience of the theater is getting younger. Overall, the art director Talhat Timian promises that the audience should expect an exciting season. The performance, Ay Karakers, will premiere on Thursday. The romantic play Balkona, directed by Yermek Amanashova, tragedy Tunshakan Sezim, directed by Seth Mamit, Carmen Sita and Kushukkeo will be staged in a theater. Honestly, I cannot say that we have no audience. The interest of younger generations in theater is growing. But before the theater used to host celebrities during new seasons, and that is including the Minister of Culture, the writer Sabit Mukhanov, who espoused Mayra, cultural figures Gabit Musrepov and Ahmed Zhubanov. Before, we used to receive compliments from the audience, but now they do not often come, even when if they are invited. This is all we have time for now. Thank you for watching. See you tomorrow.